and energy. Mm. That's what it means. And that's a very profound change in the world. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about intangible assets because uh, from my limited exposure to Hong Kong, Hong Kong seems like they have been brokers for the world for a long time. A middleman. A lot of things pass between Hong Kong. Hong Kong knows a lot about managing intangible assets because they didn't actually have any assets. They used everybody else's assets. So Hong Kong is a really good place to manage intangible assets, but I want to say a little bit more about this. Um, intangible assets are a big problem to manage. Most executives know how to figure out how much inventory they have and how much money they have in the bank and how many uh, parts they have on the shelf, but they don't know how to measure the rapport they have with their customers or the value of their brand or the value of their supply chain or the value of their intellectual property. They don't know how to figure out what their copyrights are work are their trade secrets, and if all of the executives in the world are trained in managing tangible things, mm. but the intangible things are now bigger than the tangible things, that means all the executives in the world have to get a new job. They have to learn how to do something they were not doing. And the last thing is, when you go from tangible to intangible, uh, I'm a physicist, so I have to make a physics analogy. Uh, a photon weighs less than an electron light goes faster than electricity. If something has less mass, it's easier to go faster. Intangible has less mass than tangible. So the world has radically accelerated because we're now dealing with a different set of things than just brick and mortar and a physical building and inventory. We're dealing with relationships and supply chains. So, so the world has changed and because the world has changed, Three groups of people have to change, and some people in this room are, are all three of these, and, and, but all of you are at least one. Whether you're an executive, a leader, or a teacher, you don't have the same role that you used to have 20 years ago. It's, it's a different job description and a different set of responsibilities. People like to be experts, and we all like to acknowledge experts, and having been an expert myself as an engineer and a physicist, I notice when you have all these committee meetings with the experts that we never agree with each other. So I don't think, I say experts aren't. There isn't an agreed upon point of view, especially about innovation. There's experts, it's questionable. Sage on the stage. Sage on the stage is a guy like me in front of the room talking to a bunch of people. It really needs to be a more interactive dialogue most of the time now. The leaders have to listen more because they don't have all the ideas. So if you want to innovate, you have to engage in what I call respectful listening. All ideas do not come from you. So it's very, very difficult to manage innovation because it is intangible. And people who are innovators don't like taking orders very well. They're very creative. But there is something you can manage. And that allows you to manage innovation. And that's context. Do, do you know what I mean by context? Is this a word that I'm going to explain it a little bit. Context could be a point of view. So if I look at this from this direction, I see one thing, this direction, a different thing, this direction, a different thing. Context has to do with perspective, viewpoint, vantage point. Um, you can manage the way you look at things. You can't necessarily manage creative people because they don't listen, for the most part. The real creative people quit your company and go start another company and compete with you. But if you could create conditions that make them want to stick around, by changing the context, mm -hmm. then you can keep them there. And then they will do good things for you instead of for themselves. Because they didn't really want to quit and start a company. They only did it because people like me, I invented the world's first digital piano and the first sound systems and computers, but my boss always said, don't do that. We don't need it. So I quit, start my own company and do it. This is what happens in Silicon Valley. Every day, every week, 10 people quit Cisco and start a company. Every week. 10 people quit Apple and start a company. Every week, 10 people quit Intel and start a company. They didn't really want to quit. If their boss would let them create those products within the company, they would still be there. Most engineers don't really want to run a company. They're not very well equipped to do it. But they quit because they feel the need to create something. So we have to look at things from more than one perspective. And this concept of actionable vantage point has to do with there is always a perspective from which you can have a breakthrough. Let's say you have an unsolvable problem. 
and everybody's all looking at this, that means you're not looking at it the right way. There is some other way to look at it, different vantage point. So now I'm going to really speed up. Okay.